Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this virtual community lecture focusing on prostate health through the decades. My name is Christina Cox, a communication specialist here at Providence St. John's Health Center. We are joined by Dr. Movasaki, Assistant Professor of Urologic Oncology at St. John's Cancer Institute and Director of Men's Health at St. John's Health Center. Dr. Wilson, Professor and Chair of Urology and Urology Oncology and Director of the Urologic Oncology Research Program at St. John's Cancer Institute. And Dr. Trudowski, Professor of Medical Oncology and Urology Oncology and Director of Clinical Research, Urology, and Neurologic Oncology at St. John's Cancer Institute. Before we get started, I want to let you know that this is an hour-long discussion, and we will have plenty of time for questions at the end of our physician's presentations. Please feel free to use the Q&A box to type in any questions you have throughout the presentation, and we will do our best to get to each question at the end. We will not be opening it up for attendees to speak on this webinar. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our expert team. First up is Dr. Movasaki, a board certified fellowship trained urologist with Providence St. John's Health Center. With extensive experience in endo urology and men's health, Dr. Movasaki created a first of its kind comprehensive men's health program in the Los Angeles area. He is a member of the American Urological Association and Indo Urological Society and the Society for Sexual Medicine in North America. He sits on the executive board for the American Society for Men's Health. He has published numerous peer-reviewed articles in the areas of endourology, quality of life, and integrative medicine, and he is the founder of the Los Angeles Prostate Cancer 5K. Dr. Movasagi believes the human body is the most complex piece of machinery ever made, with each system dependent on the other for peak performance. He promotes screening, education, and early treatment as the most effective ways to help people live long and healthy lives. Thanks, Christina, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, and Welcome everybody to our uh, talk tonight. Uh, so in the next 45 minutes, um, Dr. Wilson, Todarski and I will try to um, educate you guys a little bit about prostate health, uh, prostate cancer screening, treatment, and what's coming um, in terms of uh, advanced prostate cancer um, treatment. Um, so <clears throat> next slide. Right. So we'll begin with just a little bit of uh, what prostate anatomy is and what it does. So the prostate is uh, located um, between the base of the bladder uh, and the penis, and it allows the urine to flow from the bladder uh, through the penis, and it essentially functions uh, to produce the majority of the seminal fluid that helps nourish and protect sperm as it exits the body. And as we get older, uh, the prostate enlarges with age. And uh, there's a few theories as to why the prostate enlarges. Uh, most of them centered around testosterone and the, um, the, <clears throat> the prostate itself becoming more um, sensitive to the changes in testosterone levels as, as men age. Next slide. But prostate enlargement isn't prostate cancer. And I have a lot of patients that think that if they're starting to show signs of enlargement, like urinary frequency, a weak urinary stream, waking up at night, we call nocturia, or urgency, those may be related to prostate cancer. And in fact, we know that it's not. And cancer usually has no symptom, especially when it's in its, in its early stages. Next, what are prostate cancer risk factors? So age is by far the most common. Um, most, by age 80, about 60% of American men um, will likely have some sort of prostate cancer. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to affect their uh, their life expectancy anyway, um, but it does mean that it's very common um, in el elderly men. Family history um, accounts for another risk factor. In, um, five to 10% of cases are her hereditary. And based on studies, the more um, family members um, that you have with prostate cancer, the higher your chance of in, in, in developing it yourself. So if you have one, uh, a single family member with prostate cancer, male brother, father, um, then you have a 2.2 fold increase uh, with two relatives, 4.9, three relatives, 10.9. And also specific certain genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 are known to increase risk of developing cancer and BRCA2 specifically has been shown to have higher grade or more aggressive disease. Race is also a risk factor. So we know that African-American men 
um, have a higher, um, higher risk, 50% increase in incidence and 100% increase or twice the rate of prostate cancer death um, than um, other races in, in the US. Um, obesity um, has also been linked to more aggressive prostate cancer. The theories um, are related to potentially having um, poor um, screening and also a, a lower, relative lower PSA compared to uh, the, the uh, advanced stage of the disease and, uh, and, of, and toxin exposure, specifically Agent Orange. Next slide. So then why is, so, so why is prostate cancer screening important? Well, we discussed previously that it's essentially um, an asymptomatic disease. Um, and so it, prostate cancer also happens to be the number one cancer in men um, after skin cancer. So finding out early on whether or not you have the cancer um, is very important because it's, it's also 100% curable if found in its early stages. So who should get um, screened and, and when should screening happen? Well, it kind of depends on who you ask. And that's why screening has become somewhat um, so controversial. Um, if you ask the US Preventive Task Force, they recommend a shared decision-making um, for men and their doctors between the ages of 55 and 69. Um, the American Association of Family Physicians um, recommends the same thing as does the American Urologic Association. Um, ASCO, which is a, uh, a, a, the American Society of uh, Clinical Oncologists or Cancer Doctors, um, they're a little bit more um, um, lenient in terms of who should get screening. And it really depends on um, what type of life expectancy one has. Um, and again, they recommend a, a discussion with, a, with their physician. Um, and then the American Cancer Society uh, recommends screening starting at age 50 for most men and then for African-Americans and men with positive family history at age 45. And again, uh, a discussion being made with a physician at that point. And how do we do it? Well, historically, um, it was through PSA or a, a blood test. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But you know, in the last decade, we've made significant advances and I'm gonna talk about that in, in, in a minute. Next slide. So PSA or prostate specific antigen is a protein. Um, it was discovered in 1970. It's in fact the most widely used oncologic biomarker. Um, and most men, about 75% of men over the age of 50 have had at least one PSA draw, um, blood draw. Next slide. Um, it's, it's produced by the prostate, but it's also found in, in saliva, um, in pancreatic and breast tissue. Um, it's all, it's majority, the majority of it though is found in semen, urine, and blood, and it has nothing to do with prostate cancer. Its function is actually to help liquefy semen to help improve sperm um, move as they, you know, go, go on to, to do their function um, in terms of trying to uh, fertilize an egg. Um, it's found in free and bound form uh, in, in the blood. Next but PSA is not perfect. In fact, when it comes to prostate cancer, um, its sensitivity is only about 35%, um, depending on what study you look at, up to 70%. And specificity is only, you know, ranges from 60% to 90%. So in many cases, PSA elevation could be wrong. Um, and when PSA is used as a screening tool for performing a biopsy by itself, um, it can only catch prostate cancer 60 to 80% of the time. Um, traditionally, the cutoff for PSA was four, but we no longer use that as an absolute indication. Um, and we know that as men get older and the prostate changes, that that four cutoff is no longer an absolute. And, and in fact, in, in, we increase it with age. And there are other factors that can change PSA, infection, inflammation, instrumentation, uh, either urinary retention or your, a urinary infection, um, and ej ejaculation, um, any sort of manipulation of the prostate can elevate PSA, um, and advanced age and just benign enlargement can affect PSA. Next slide. So in the last decade, we've had um, significant advances in other types of biomarkers, imaging, and so on, um, as to help us um, determine if some one has an elevated PSA if they really need to take the next step and do something invasive like a biopsy. Next. 
So in our practice, um, we use a few different biomarkers. Um, the one that we use, it's a blood test, it's called the 4K test. It's a blood test that looks at not just the total PSA, but also free PSA, intact PSA, and another protein that's circulating in the blood called HK2. And what this company does is that they put the objective information uh, into the algorithm along with patient age, um, prior biopsy status, uh, the rectal exam findings, and gives us a, um, a, a percentage of what's the likelihood of finding prostate cancer um, if the patient is to undergo biopsy. What's great about this test is that it doesn't look for low risk or prostate cancer that is um, generally uh, not very active. It looks for more aggressive disease. And that's the key about prostate cancer is that it doesn't all come in one um, form. It's not like pancreatic cancer, which is all generally very aggressive. If you have a low risk, um, low aggressive cancer, then it doesn't necessarily need treatment or diagnosis for that matter. Um, but it, you know, if you have a more aggressive disease, then treatment is, is recommended. And this is what this test allows us to do. Next slide. We also use another test, which is called the MDX Select, which is really a liquid biopsy. The way that this is performed this is when a patient has an elevated PSA, um, when they come to the office, um, I'll examine them. We'll usually do a, rec, uh, a digital rectal exam. And then we have the patient um, go and give us a urine sample. And based on that urine sample, um, we uh, send that out and send it out for this test. And it uses the cells that are excreted in the urine um, to determine if those cells are producing specific types of proteins, the ones mentioned here, uh, that are associated generally with prostate cancer. And if those proteins are picked up um, in those cells, um, or at least the genetic material for these proteins is picked up, then there's a higher likelihood that if the patient undergoes a biopsy, um, we're going to find prostate cancer. Um, so the sensitivity for these tests compared to PSA alone um, is in the 80% range. So it allows us to, with better accuracy, um, tell patients whether or not they need to have a biopsy um, and hopefully avoid un unnecessary biopsies. Next. So what also, what, what also has occurred in the last decade or 15 years is that um, multi-parametric prostate MRIs have become increasingly useful in helping us determine uh, both the need for a prostate biopsy, um, and also they are now helping us in treating prostate cancer uh, by guiding us as to where the cancer lies. Um, so the MRI, um, we use different phases in the MRI, and if given with uh, gadolinium, which is contrast material, we can determine um, where high-grade disease lies within the gland. Um, it's also possible to do the MRs without gadolinium, but the sensitivity does drop a, uh, a little bit. And the MRI sensitivity for detecting small aggressive tumors as little as two millimeters is around 80%. Uh, and by knowing where the cancer lies, uh, we're no longer limited by doing a standard, um, essentially random biopsy sample, and we can do more targeted infusion biopsies. Next slide. So, um, next slide. So, the prostate biopsy is essentially the next step in diagnosing prostate cancer. So, you know, in the patient journey, we have a patient who um, has an elevated PSA. We've uh, we've done the other bi biomarker testings, and we've determined that the patient is a candidate for undergoing prostate biopsy. Um, we've done an MRI and, you know, presumably the MRI has shown something. And so then the prostate biopsy is the natural next step. Now, prior to having um, the MRs, um, prostate biopsies were done just using ultrasound. Excuse me. And um, in the U.S., we'd have an annual, um, you know, more than 1.2 million prostate biopsies being done. Um, and, you know, only 30% of the men that underwent the prostate uh, biopsy ended up having prostate cancer. There was a high false um, negative rate because 
the prostate cancers were being missed. Um, and it was also finding a lot of these cancers that don't necessarily need treatment. And so, um, there, and there ended up being over treatment of biopsy. So there was a need for better uh, biopsies. Next slide. And so if you can see um, in, you know, where the arrows point, you know, where the needles would go to try to pick up the cancer, if we were lucky, as in, you know, point A, you'd actually find the cancer with your, you know, random biopsies. But if you're unlucky in point B and C, uh, you would miss the cancer even though it was there. Next slide. So in the last decade, we've been able to now do MRI-guided prostate biopsies, where we can take the patient's MRI, load it into um, our, our system, which is called the Euronap system, and then fuse that image with a real-time ultrasound so that we can actually go and directly take a sample of where the prostate cancer presumably is. So in my practice, I not only do the targeted biopsy, but I also check for um, the standard template biopsy in order to make sure that we're not missing anything that the MR had missed. Because remember, the MR is only sensitive 80% of the time. Um, but nonetheless, this allows for better biopsies, more accurate diagnosis. And as Dr. Wilson will talk about pre um, shortly, but it'll also allow for what we call focal treatment of disease, um, where if only one area of the prostate has disease, then only that area will have to be treated. Next slide. So I, I basically just talked about the uranaf fusion prostate biopsies. Um, next slide. And you can see here that you know, using the technology, we have the ultrasound in the middle of the screen and then the um, target that we have shown that the radiologist has pointed for us, uh, point, pointed out prior to the biopsy and we can direct our um, needle directly to the center of the core and try to get that biopsy sample. Next. And you can see, you know, when you do a standard template, not only are you getting different areas within the prostate, uh, but you're also getting specifically the, uh, the target that likely has the, uh, the pro that's harboring the prostate cancer. So now in the same patient journey, we've diagnosed the patient with prostate cancer, but what, Historically, what we would do is just determine if they have low-grade disease, intermediate-grade disease, or high-grade disease. And that was based on what the pathologist would see under the microscope. But again, in the last you know, 10 years, we are going beyond that, that we now are looking at these samples at, down to the tumor genetic level. So we're no longer just relying on what the cancer is, looks like under a microscope but we can tell what is this cancer acting like. And by, based on the different proteins and the genes that are turned on or off, um, there's several companies that provide this, um, um, this, this service and, and the, these tests. Um, and each of them um, have different, essentially pros and cons and different studies. Um, the most studied tends to be the Prolaris, uh, which comes from Myriad, followed by Decipher, uh, which uh, both Dr. Wilson and I commonly use in our practice. Next. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Wilson, um, and then we'll do questions, I think, at the end. Thank you so much for that information. Next up is Dr. Wilson, a board-certified urologist who has vast experience with minimally, minimally invasive laparoscopic and robotic assisted urologic oncology. He is one of the top six surgeons in the world in terms of volume that performs robotic assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy. I think I said that wrong, he'll say it right. <laughs> Dr. Wilson is a member of the American Urological Association and the Society of Urologic Oncology. Throughout his tenure that spans nearly 30 years, he has published numerous peer reviewed articles and book chapters in the areas of urologic oncology, urinary reconstruction and robotic surgery. Dr. Wilson's medical philosophy is to provide safe treatments to patients that can not only cure their cancer, but minimize pain, suffering, and complications. Dr. Wilson, take it away. 
Thank you, Christina, and welcome everyone. And thanks for joining us at this webinar um, about prostate cancer uh, during Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Um, Christina, answer me this. Can you see my slides in the correct format? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna talk about what happens once men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. I think, if I can, it, oh, there we go. Okay, so first what happens is this kind of reaction. Oh my God, I've got prostate cancer and what am I gonna do about it? And um, you're told by the urologist that the biopsy is positive. You've got prostate cancer. Um, you know, come in next week. We'll discuss, you know, what um, the details about it and, and what to do. And unfortunately, what happens is that oftentimes because yeah, to, to no fault of the urologist, really, but, you know, because they're busy and actually urologists these days are in short supply. Uh, they're often handed uh, this book uh, by a famous urologist, Dr. Patrick Walsh. Um, you know, how to survive prostate cancer. And the urologist comment, I've heard this story many times, the, um, the urologist gives the patient the book. He says, you've got prostate cancer, go home, read this book, come back and see me in a couple of weeks and tell me what you want to do. Um, so the patient does that, he buys the book, and then he realizes shortly that it's a little bit confusing and complicated because, yeah, as you can see here, um, there's multiple different options for treatment, whether it be different kinds of radiation, such as beam radiation, seed radiation called brachytherapy, taking out the prostate, which is called radical prostatectomy, and different, even different kinds of that, just monitoring or active surveillance, different kinds of hormone therapy, freezing the prostate with cryosurgery, using high intensity focused ultrasound, chemotherapy, maybe even experimental drugs. So, you know, how do you decide what to do? Um, and I think, What's really important, and I think uh, because, you know, having cancer is an extremely scary thing, but I want you to know that if you've just been diagnosed with prostate cancer, that you are not in any sort of immediate danger. And this is a highly treatable and most times curable disease. It's very rare that we would have to do anything emergent. Um, that happens periodically, but it's really quite uncommon. So the first step is, is to understand that you need, you have time to make a rational decision about how to manage your prostate cancer and how to educate yourself and make a decision about what makes sense for you. So when you're first diagnosed, it's important to gather information and to understand your stage, which really means the extent of the cancer, just not only locally, you know, is it confined to the prostate or is there any evidence of spread beyond the prostate? So really what we're doing here is assessing the risk. The risk that this cancer will grow and spread and potentially get outside the prostate and what's the time frame that that's gonna happen. And urologists and medical oncologists and radiation oncologists that specialize in prostate cancer assess this risk by looking at several different things. They, we look at the PSA. Um, they actually, even though as Dr. Movasaki pointed out, the PSA is not very accurate in helping us uh, diagnose prostate cancer, and we use other adjuncts to help us decide when to biopsy. It, its absolute value is important in determining risk of spread if, if we know that someone has prostate cancer. Number two, we wanna know something called the Gleason score. I'll talk about that in a second. You wanna know how many of the biopsies were positive of the total number of biopsies, how many were positive for cancer and where are they positive? The details of the MRI, as Dr. Mobisagi alluded to, is very important in determining um, the extent of the cancer and what kinds of treatment, if you need treatment, um, are best. And then further staging to look at where the cancer may have spread, historically was always done with a CT scan and bone scan, but recently the FDA approved a new kind of PET scan called PSMA, or prostate-specific membrane antigen. And although it's not widely available yet, we have experience with it here, um, but it's just going to start getting paid for by Medicare and insurance companies over the next probably several months it'll take for that to be widely available. So this is what the bio, this is a schematic. You can see these, these three different cartoons, <clears throat> two at the top, one at the bottom. Uh, the two little circles at the top uh, left and right, or what are labeled SV, or represent seminal vesicles that are attached to the prostate and make semen. 
And then there's left and right. The base is up near the, bl uh, the bladder, the apex down near the penis. And these, in, these, in these schematics, the little red areas represent where the prostate cancer is being found on the prostate. On the top left, this, this gentleman has cancer just on the left base and mid portion. On the top right, this gentleman has cancer in the seminal vesicles along each side of the prostate, right and left. And the, and the, the prostate on the bottom, that this gentleman has cancer in the mid portion on the left and the apex on the left, and just a little bit on the uh, right apex as well. So those kinds of details as the patient, the doctor's gonna look at this and analyze it. You wanna know yourself, the full extent of your cancer, and you also wanna know the characteristics of it in terms of what's called the Gleason's grading system. Now, this guy Gleason was a pathologist from Minnesota, and in the late 1970s described a system for looking at prostate cancer under the microscope. Now, initially the Gleason's grades were on a scale of one to five. You look at the cartoon on the right side that's in black, this represents grades one through five, although we now know um, that grades one and two, as Gleason described them, aren't really cancer. These car this cartoon really represents what the pathologist looks at in order to make a decision as to the aggressiveness of the cancer. Just by way of demonstration, if someone had all grade three, nothing but grade three in their biopsy, by convention, we call that a three plus three for a Gleason score of six. If it happens to be primarily grade four with less than 50% grade five, we call it a Gleason score of nine. And today, the, most, the, more, um, the more recent grouping of Gleason's grade, uh, grade sco uh, Gleason scores are in Gleason's grade groups, grades one through five again, where three plus three is group one and so on. Gleason's grade group two, primarily grade three with some four. Gleason's grade group three, primarily four with some three. Gleason's grade four, all combinations of score eight and Gleason's grade group five, the most aggressive, all grades four or five. So as Dr. Movasagi um, uh, talked about, the MRI, the multiparametric MRI is extremely important. In this particular MRI, we've got circled here an area on one phase of the uh, MRI showing this dark wedge here at the bottom, correlating with where it picks up contrast. That's important for us to look at to determine, number one, is how big it is, where it is, how close it is to the edge of the prostate, but also important, as Dr. Movasaki also pointed out, we want to know where the other biopsies might be positive that the MRI didn't see, because that can help determine what options are available for that particular gentleman. So the first thing to talk about is whether or not, and to understand whether or not, if you've got cancer that appears to be confined to the prostate, and if the Gleason score is low, typically Gleason score three plus three or Gleason's grade group one, then you might be a candidate for active surveillance. So if the risk is low and the aggressiveness is low based on the Gleason score, and if the PSA is generally low and stable or rising slowly, and there's small volume disease, and if you're mentally and emotionally capable to understand that I've got a little bit of cancer that's not that aggressive and it can be monitored, then you might, you might be an excellent candidate for what's called active surveillance. And we understood over the last 20 years or so that many men that used to be diagnosed with prostate cancer have low risk, low volume, non-aggressive prostate cancer that can be monitored. And typically this means what we're doing is checking PSAs every four to six months. We'll typically re-biopsy at least once within the first year of the original biopsy to make sure that we didn't miss something uh, on the first one, something more aggressive or more cancer. And then going forward, we still get PSAs every four to six months with an MRI once a year and biopsy if that, if that MRI or the PSA is changing. Now, active surveillance works if we select the right men. And this, study, and this study from Johns Hopkins published as long ago in 2011, they studied men since 1995, nearly 800 men. Over time, 35% of men these, at this time, we were biopsying men every year, and 35% of men eventually were found to have a worse cancer and needed treatment, but a full 65% didn't. And in this study, which went on for 15 years, nobody died from prostate cancer. 65% of guys never needed treatment, 
35% went on to get either radiation or surgery in this study. Nobody died from prostate cancer. So as Dr. Also, as Dr. Movisagi alluded to, sometimes if we think that somebody is a candidate for active surveillance, but they're young and healthy, we confirm this by doing these additional tests, these genetic tests on the, on the biopsy material itself, once made by Myriad called Prolaris, another one called, called Decipher, which is part of the NCCN guidelines, the National Cancer Center Network. And these, these sorts of tests can help decide or give us an idea as to who's gonna progress, who's gonna get worse, and therefore we might do treatment earlier and determine that that gentleman's not a candidate for active surveillance. What about focal therapy? This is now becoming popular over the last few years. There are two techniques that are used for, um, for focal therapy. This is uh, what I think is kind of analogous to a lumpectomy in breast cancer. We're not, although in this case, we're not really taking out the lump of cancer. What we're doing is ablating that lump of cancer, either with heat, with HIFU, high intensity focused ultrasound, or by freezing that spot. So, you know, and this, this, this slide represents uh, what the freezing would look like. You can see at the bottom uh, in this schematic, the ultrasound probe, that black tube is in the rectum. It sees the prostate um, and the needles here are going through the perineum underneath the scrotum into the prostate guided by the MRI to specifically freeze one part of the prostate. This is uh, a picture of what's called um, the, the focal one HIFU, high intensity focused ultrasound device that we have here at St. John's. Dr. Movisagi is an expert with this, has done many cases over the last few years in men that qualify for HIFU. Dr. Kelly, who is also on our team, not speaking tonight, is an expert with cryosurgery. So we use both these technologies based on the different characteristics of the cancer um, and who qualifies. So the advantages and disadvantages of focal therapy would be that number one, we, we select men based if the cancer is just located, the significant cancer is located just in one section or one area of the prostate, and then it correlates with the MRI because the MRI guides the biopsy. Usually, however, we will not think that these treatments are best if the, if the cancer is really aggressive, aggressive, like Gleason's groups, grade groups four and five. Um, the, the advantages in this kind of treatment are that it usually has minimal side effects on bladder function or erectile sexual function. In addition, if it fails, it's, can, it's generally thought that you might be able to retreat that area in the future. Although um, that, that could potentially uh, make further treatments down the road more difficult. We, we won't have time to talk about that tonight, but, but indeed there's pros and cons of this. If men have uh, focal therapy, they're typically monitored with periodic MRIs once a year and periodic biopsies, somewhat like active surveillance. And one of the problems, however, is that if men have had this sort of energy, like freezing or heat to the prostate, it will make subsequent treatments like radiation or surgery somewhat more difficult and the side effects somewhat higher of those particular treatments down the road. And we don't really have good long-term data in terms of you know, the absolute cure rates or how many men need retreatment or long-term side effects. So um, it's relatively new to the United States, uh, and, but we're using it as focal therapy to treat specific areas that the prostate sees, that the MRI sees in the prostate that correlate with where the biopsies are positive. So if men, if men have cancer on both sides of the prostate, um, or if it's most aggressive, then generally speaking, we'll think that those men need what we refer to as whole gland therapy. They need to have the entire prostate treated. Um, of course, in the lumpectomy or focal therapy, whole gland therapy, active surveillance, in all of these men, none of these men we think will have any evidence of cancer outside of the prostate. The metastatic workup with a bone scan or a CT scan or a PET scan show cancer that's essentially only limited to the prostate or maybe just minimally beyond the prostate. So whole gland therapy is generally referring to either delivering radiation energy to the prostate or 
The other option would be surgical removal, removing the entire prostate um, or a complete prostatectomy. It's often called radical prostatectomy. That's an old term, kind of a scary term. What it really means is complete removal of the prostate. Now, there are a couple of different kinds of radiation treatment. One is to deliver radioactive seeds to the prostate. And in this kind of treatment, each little seed that's placed in the prostate is done through the perineum. If you can see on the cartoon to the left, this is a cutaway through um, longitudinally through the pelvis. The gentleman's um, bottom end is to your right. His leg is pointing up. The penis is up here. Um, the probe, the ultrasound probe is in the uh, rectum seeing the prostate and the needles are placed through the perineum into the prostate gland. I used to do a lot of this kind of treatment when I was at City of Hope um, in the late 90s, throughout the 2000s. Works quite well, it's an outpatient treatment. And if you look to the panel to the, the, the right, the concept here is that each little seed by virtue of delivering a little bit of radiation, all these seeds combine, create kind of a cloud of radiation to cover the whole prostate, but to minimize radiation exposure to the urethra or to the rectum, which sits down below. But what about beam radiation? There's a variety of different kinds of radiation. Beam radiation, often referred to as IMRT, SBRT, EBRT, external beam radiation, uses a linear accelerator. And here's a picture of a patient sitting on, on a platform on a, um, that sits underneath this linear accelerator, which, del which delivers a focused, um, highly accurate beam of radiation onto the area of interest, in this case, the prostate. Pros and cons of radiation. Well, number one, it helps you avoid surgery. Um, you don't have to have an, under, an anesthesia, although the brachytherapy seeds is an outpatient procedure that's done under an anesthesia, takes about an hour and a half to two hours. The beam radiation, usually it goes over a period of a few weeks, anywhere from two to seven weeks, depending on the characteristics of the cancer. Um, different details about radiation. Sometimes if the cancer is more aggressive and men are gonna get radiation, then we'll often recommend that men get what's called hormone therapy in addition. Dr. Twardowski is gonna talk about that in more detail. The treatment of, of beam radiation is typically daily over a period of a few to several weeks. But as I said, the treatment with seeds, radioactive seeds called brachytherapy is in the operating room under an anesthesia. Sometimes radiation oncologists specialize, that specialize in, in prostate cancer will elect to treat with a combination of beam and seeds. And there's, again, pros and cons of each one. one. One major con is that during the time of radiation or afterwards, it could be irritation to the bladder or the bowel movements for several weeks to a few months and then rarely long-term. Another downside is that if the cancer, if the radiation treatment isn't successful, if the cancer is persistent or comes back, it can make subsequent treatments like removal much, much more difficult and the side effects therefore much higher. But again, it depends on the characteristics of the cancer as to how likely the, the radiation is to be successful. Also, one, one small downside is that the PSA will never be zero uh, after a radiation therapy, unless it's in combination with hormone therapy. But generally speaking, the PSA is detectable, and that can lead to sometimes confusion as to whether or not the cancer has been adequately treated or not. Finally, just a word about current surgery. So um, prostatectomies have been done for decades. Uh, in the 1990s, I did them the old-fashioned open way. We did them regular laparoscopic in the early 2000s. But for the last 20 years, we've been doing uh, robot-assisted radical prostatectomies with this da Vinci robot. In this cartoon, you can see the surgeon theoretically looking into a viewer where he has a 3D view and completely controls this robot, which is seen in the middle, which hovers over the patient. And like a laparoscopic procedure operating in a dome that's insufflated by carbon dioxide, the surgeon has room to work to completely and accurately remove the prostate with minimal damage to neighboring tissues. Pros and cons of surgery. Well, the pro is the cancer's out and some men just feel better if the cancer's out and therefore it has really the highest chance of cure. 
You also, you, you get to know the full details of the cancer, the stage, the lymph nodes, another relook at the Gleason score. Typically, if men are candidates for surgery, we're able to avoid hormone therapy. They don't need that up front. Typically also the PSA would become non-detectable, go zero after surgery. And it's generally to easy, uh, it's easier typically to monitor men as a result of the PSA being so accurate after prostate cancer, after prostate removal. And therefore giving, we sometimes can give radiation with good results and minimal side effects to help uh, get a second chance at cure if those men aren't cured by surgery. The downsides are that there's usually stress incontinence of urine that will, in other words, men leak with coughing or sneezing or lifting. This typically resolves over a few, over a few weeks, but it may take months for it to resolve. And there is usually always at least a temporary erectile dysfunction where the um, men are unable to uh, achieve enough rigidity to have penetrative intercourse. But it's important to know that if you have your prostate out, if this doesn't affect actually your sex drive because we're not affecting the hormone, the hormone levels, testosterone in your body, we're not, affecting pen, we're not affecting penile sensation, the way the penis feels to touch. And furthermore, we're not, we're not affecting the ability to feel the sensation of orgasm, the feeling of climax. Although typically with orgasm, if men have had a prostatectomy, of course, there's no more semen because we've taken out the organ that makes the semen. So finally, and in summary, I think it's really important that when you're, if and when you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, take a deep breath, understand that you're not in any immediate danger, gather information, know what your PSA is, know the details of your MRI, know, the, know what your Gleason's grade group is, how many biopsies are positive, where the biopsies are positive. Have you had any staging scans like a PSMA PET scan or a CT scan or a bone scan? Ask your doctor, do I need one? Um, you have time to choose the right treatment that makes sense for you. Get several opinions. Get Find experts in radiation oncology, surgery, high food, cryosurgery. Find out if you qualify for these kinds of treatments and get an opinion from a medical oncologist like Dr. Trudowski that you'll meet. Don't do it just because that's what my buddy did. So with that, I'll finish and I'll turn it over to Dr. Trudowski. Thank you, Tim. Dr. Wilson, uh, just to introduce Dr. Twardowski, uh, he is a board certified medical oncologist who has vast experience in the management of genitourinary malignancies, including prostate, bladder, kidney, and testicular cancers. Uh, thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> um, oh. Over the last 20 years, he was a principal investigator and contributor to multiple clinical trials that expanded treatment options for patients with cancers of the genital urinary tract. Dr. Targowski is a member of the American Society of Clinical Oncology and was selected as one of America's top doctors multiple times. He has published more than 100 scientific articles, abstracts, and book chapters, and he lectures nationally and internationally. Dr. Targowski's medical philosophy is to provide compassionate, state-of-the-art cancer treatment, always taking into account each patient's unique circumstances and values. All right, thank you so much for this very nice introduction. It's a really pleasure and honor to be uh, with all of you and, and uh, share the stage with my great colleagues. Um, can you see my screen? Is, is it projecting okay, Christina? Yes, it is. Um, so uh, my uh, portion of the presentation will focus on uh, treatment of uh, more advanced prostate cancer. So I'm a medical oncologist and uh, I specialize in treatment of patients who uh, have this more aggressive subtype of prostate cancer that can potentially be life-threatening, uh, frequently metastasizes uh, to other organs and requires uh, sometimes quite aggressive systemic therapy, drug therapy. Um, this is just a little bit of a background and we've touched upon that a little bit today that uh, there's kind of a mixed uh, news in terms of um, uh, numbers you know, for prostate cancer. So uh, it's a very common cancer as uh, we've mentioned before, the most common non-skin cancer. Um, the good news is that you can see uh, when you compare incidents or new cases to mortality, you know, the vast majority of patients 
do not die from prostate cancer. So there's a tremendous difference between diagnosis and mortality. So vast majority uh, of patients either outlive prostate cancer or are cured with some of these great therapies that uh, Dr. Wilson Mubasagi talked about. But the flip side of it is that still because of the large number of cases, just pure numbers, the, there is a relative uh, high number of, of patients that actually do die from prostate cancer and it accounts for you know, second most common cancer related death in men in the United States uh, after uh, lung cancer. But still uh, most of patients uh, from prostate, uh, with prostate cancer do not die from it. When you look, for example, at pancreas cancer incidence, 21,000 mortality, 18,000, it's almost the same. It gives you an idea how incredibly dangerous and lethal uh, pancreas cancer is compared to, to prostate cancer. Uh, but still, you know, if the cancer spreads, and that maybe happens in approximately 20% of patients, uh, 25 percent of patients uh, with a diagnosis of prostate cancer, it is a dangerous disease over uh, long term. And, and as you can see, uh, we've made significant prob uh, progress in treatment of this disease, even in the setting of advanced metastatic disease. So going back you know, 1994, the average survival when the prostate cancer metastasized outside of its uh, origin to areas like bones or lymph nodes. Survival was three years by 2013, five years. Now the latest data uh, that I've seen uh, reported uh, this year, seven years survival on average, although uh, about a quarter of patients can survive more than 10 years. So again, very long life expectancy now, even in patients uh, who have very advanced prostate cancer. Um, uh, why are we doing better? I uh, came up with few uh, reasons that I think are responsible for that. Certainly we have better drugs. We learn how to use them effectively. So we combine them together uh, in a more rational way and we treat cancer more aggressively uh, earlier in the disease course. So we don't wait necessarily for one drug to fail and switch to another drug, but we tend to combine two or even three drugs early on and provide this very, very profound anti-cancer effect. We uh, understand molecular genetics of prostate cancer better, and that resulted in development of some drugs that attack specific DNA mutation. We also are better at imaging of metastatic disease, and I'll show some of the pictures later uh, that illustrate this uh, revolution of imaging with uh, PSMA PET scan that uh, Dr. Wilson mentioned, and that allows us perhaps to incorporate radiation and surgery, uh, not only for the treatment of uh, just local disease, but also to go after some isolated metastasis. Uh, and that may also provide long-term benefit to patients. And we do have better supportive care and are better in management of uh, side effects of some of these medications and medical complications. Uh, here is just a few examples of drugs that uh, obtain FDA approval for advanced prostate cancer in the last few years. Um, and this is not the, uh, not the complete list, but I thought I list the most important ones. So Olaparib approved uh, last year and Rucaparib almost within, essentially within a few days. Uh, those are targeted drugs that uh, are used for patients with specific DNA mutations. Uh, uh, like BRCA2, BRCA1, or similar uh, DNA abnormalities. Uh, these other three are examples of new generation hormonal agents that are still very, very widely used and important in our treatment portfolio. So I actually th think of um, cancer treatment uh, options in terms of kind of six main pillars. Um, and uh, surgery, of course, is, remains a mainstay of a localized treatment, but when you start talking about advanced prostate cancer or uh, advanced cancer, uh, here are kind of the main categories of treatments that you can come up with. So hormonal therapy, certainly very, very important in prostate cancer. Here are some examples of drugs that um, are utilized uh, in, in that category, and those are relatively new drugs in the last uh, you know, six, seven, eight years uh, in terms of their development. Radiation therapy, Dr. Wilson mentioned, 
in terms of local treatment for prostate cancer that is still confined to the gland, and that's what I would refer to as standard radiation, but you can also think of radiation in more systemic way uh, as radioactive isotope treatments. And those are actually molecules that are radioactive that are injected intravenously and uh, migrate to, for example, areas of bone metastasis like this drug Zofigo. And also this drug generates a lot of enthusiasm, even though it hasn't been approved yet, but it's uh, expected to be approved by FDA quite imminently. Lutetium-177 PSMA targeting that very specific prostate cancer related molecule on the surface of cancer cell. And then more standard chemotherapy drugs, still very important targeted therapy drugs that I mentioned like Olaparib and Rucaparib that are applicable to about 25% of patients that have these specific DNA mutations that we can now detect very easily uh, either by analyzing cancer tissue or even with special uh, blood tests focusing on circulating tumor DNA. Immunotherapy has been making tremendous inroads in many other uh, cancer types. I would argue perhaps less so in prostate cancer, although we have one drug that has relatively broad application. Uh, it kind of has the features of the cancer vaccine called Provench. And then in very selected few cases, we can use a drug called pembrolizumab, but that requires very rare mutational pattern uh, in the tumor tissue. Now, uh, prostate cancer is still very much, or treatment uh, for prostate cancer is very much dependent on, um, on that concept of hormonal therapy or hormone blockade. And it really reflects the fact that prostate cancer is driven to grow and metastasize by uh, male androgen hormone testosterone. Now, we, we do not think that testosterone causes prostate cancer. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's certainly maybe a little bit of a misconception, but, uh, but once the prostate cancer develops, for whatever reason that we may not fully understand, it is true that testosterone acts kind of as a fuel for prostate cancer growth and spread and blocking testosterone hormone production and function, uh, uh, which is frequently referred to as hormone therapy or um, perhaps maybe a less uh, acceptable term by many men, castration therapy or androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, these essentially kind of reflect uh, more or less the same thing continues to a backbone of treatment for advanced prostate cancer, and in my opinion, will remain so in the foreseeable future. And, and uh, I came up with this cartoon uh, myself. I showed it to my PA animal who thought it was very confusing, but uh, nevertheless, I'll take a risk and try to explain what I meant by this. I was trying to illustrate that prostate cancer is a little bit unique and different than other tumor types in the sense that it's really, really dependent on this androgen testosterone pathway signaling. So this is illustrated by that arrow, which essentially shows the cancer utilizing these cascade of testosterone driven genes and, and uh, enzymes and for growth. And we block this with a drug, you know, for example, Lupron or uh, Extandi or other drug, eventually it does become resistant to it, but the way it, it becomes resistant to it, that it essentially reactivates the same pathway, it breaks through it. Uh, and anytime the PSA uh, number goes up in somebody with advanced prostate cancer, that indicates that this treatment failed and the pathway got reactivated. Now, this is a little bit different than in other cancers. With you, usually when you block certain dominant pathway of signaling or growth it, with a drug, which is kind of illustrated by that green bar, it doesn't get reactivated. It just, you know, cancer finds the other alternative with by, bypassing pathways. So I think what I was trying to just illustrate how dominant testosterone signaling is in pathophysiology of prostate cancer, because sometimes patients ask me, well, how come we're still using hormone therapy? You know, that concept goes back 40, 50 years and we can't get away uh, from it and, and really can't because it's such a key element of prostate cancer biology. We're still exploiting uh, you know, inhibition of that pathway for therapeutic purposes. Switching gears a little bit to imaging that we've touched upon today, this is really um, 
undergoing quite a revolution uh, with the introduction of these PSMA scans. So, so this is just an illustration on the left side, A, those two images is a standard bone scan in the same patients comparing to PSMA scan. And you know uh, this patient, these black areas essentially, except here, which is normal bladder, but the black areas, very black areas, dark areas indicate the presence of cancer. But as you can see on the regular bone scan, we just see a few spots. In the same patient on PSMA scan, we see how incredibly widespread the cancer is and how uh, this bone scan is underestimating the extent of disease. Now, granted, the, the, some of the areas here are normal physiological, but all of these dots here essentially reflect cancer that was missed on standard bone scan. So that potentially has a huge implications for you know, how we would treat this gentleman. Uh, now, this was taken from, uh, from just the web. Uh, this is actually my uh, patient that I'm showing the different kind of scenario where the patient um, uh, also had negative kind of normal scans, but on the PSMA PET that we did here as a part of clinical trial, he had this one spot, one isolated area of metastasis in the spine uh, that was not seen anywhere else. And that allowed us to kind of focus uh, on this particular region with uh, focal stereotactic radiation therapy. And, and that uh, potentially uh, provides you know, significant therapeutic uh, effect. Uh, so uh, as I think Tim, Dr. Wilson mentioned that some of these scans have been recently actually approved by FDA they have very complicated, weird names. As you can see, the latest one was approved just in May. Uh, there was another one uh, primarily uh, developed at UCLA, approved in December. I actually think that they will become uh, more available uh, sooner than Tim even mentioned uh, in terms of insurance coverage. I was told that probably even in October, we we'll may be able to commercially uh, order uh, these scans and have them reimbursed by insurance, but um, let's, uh, let's see how it goes. Hopefully that's the case. Now this PSMA molecule is very important in physiology of prostate cancer because that not only serves, I'll go back a couple of slides, not only serves as a potential uh, for imaging of that molecule with a certain radioactive tracer like gallium or sodium uh, fluoride, but if you replace this tracer with stronger radiation molecule like lutetium or actinium that can act as a therapeutic agent. And sometimes that's referred to this concept of, uh, uh, of both kind of using a certain molecule for imaging, but also alternatively therapeutic applications as theranostics. And one of the agents in development that um, we are very excited about that should be approved by FDA is in fact, uh, belonging to that category. So it, it kind of targets that PSMA specific prostate specific membrane antigen molecule that is you know, heavily expressed on a majority of prostate cancer cells, but it's uh, also attached to this radioactive uh, compound lutetium that provides a uh, you know, killing effect against prostate cancers from within. So that's injected intravenously and you know, migrates to the areas where prostate cancer is located. Um, so this is kind of the 30,000 feet overview uh, of advanced uh, prostate cancer treatment. Uh, now, what are some of my predictions for the future? It's very difficult really to um, think five years or more ahead, but within next five years, I would say that um, the focus is gonna be on continuous refinement of more effective hormonal therapies. There are many agents in that category in development. Then we'll definitely get better with drugs that are based on targeting specific DNA mutations. And some of them are already in use as I mentioned before, but many more to come. And also we'll definitely focus on new concepts in employing immunotherapy better to make it more relevant in majority of prostate cancer patients. So I think we uh, run a little bit over time, but uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, maybe we'll have some time for, for questions uh, if uh, Christina allows. Thank you. I will absolutely allow. <laughs> Not to worry. Thank you so much, Dr. Kordowski. And thank you to our, our wonderful team of physicians for those incredibly informative presentations. Uh, before we begin our Q&A, uh, we have a few questions for you. Um, a poll is going to pop up on your screen, so please feel free to give us your honest feedback, and we would greatly appreciate it. 
And now we will go ahead and begin our Q&A as well. So please feel free to um, answer any or submit any questions to our Q&A box. I know there was one question that popped up in our, our chat box and it was, are there any post-surgery physical therapy needs after a prostatectomy? Um, so I can answer that question perhaps. Um, yeah, so um, just briefly, yeah. So physical therapy, is it always necessary? Um, about 65% of men are dry or should be at about six weeks and about 85% at three months. But if men are struggling with stress, urinary leakage, then there's uh, pelvic floor exercises, pelvic floor physical therapy referred to as Kegel exercises that can be um, practiced and taught with physical therapists that can help them um, more quickly gain their continence back. And another question that came through is, can BPH treatments such as TURP contribute to risk of prostate cancer? Can you repeat that question? Can BPH treatment such as TURP TURP contribute to risk of prostate cancer? No. Um, generally speaking, where prostate cancer lies and where we do the treatment for prostate, um, BPH symptoms are different. Um, and the region that we treat during a TERP um, is essentially around the urethra, and that's not where we find most of the cancers. Um, so the thinking that maybe that inflammation or you know, the surgery itself can lead to ongoing changes within the gland, that's, that's never been found. And also, some patients ask me, well, I really don't want to get a biopsy because I've been told that if I have a biopsy, then that can essentially upset the tumor and cause it to spread all over um, or seed um, other areas or other organs. And that also, in the case of prostate cancer, is not true. Um, and you know, although we do, we do see seeding in some other forms of cancers in the prostate, that's not been seen. Another question we have is what can a person do to keep prostate cancer from occurring? Is there a diet relationship? So I can take that and then Tim, you wanna continue? Sure. Or I always tell patients, you know, whatever you do for your heart, you do for your prostate. So if it's healthy for your heart, it's healthy for your prostate. And generally more and more studies are coming out of the Mediterranean diet is kind of the way to go um, in terms of prostate health. And there's several studies that have linked um, high sugar, high refined sugar diets um, to more risk of developing prostate cancer and also prostate enlargement. So <clears throat> although I'm not an advocate of things like Atkins or keto, um, I think Mediterranean diets where you're focusing on, um, you know, vegetables, good oils, some fruits and uh, meats, meats and um, in, in small quantities, as well as the dairy products in small quantities um, is ideal. Yeah, right. So I, I would only, I, I think that's exactly right. And we, we generally think that whatever is heart healthy is cancer preventative. So, and in fact, most men, as Dr. Trudowski, uh pointed out, you know, most men with prostate cancer don't, don't die from prostate cancer. They, actually, the most common cause of death is heart disease. So, um, you know, it's important to keep your blood pressure under control, keep your cholesterol under control, keep your waistline uh, I struggle with that myself, keep it down 36 inches or less and um, exercise regularly and, um, you know, uh, eat a heart healthy diet. Um, there is some evidence in the world's literature, although it's never really been well um, adapted by the medical community. And there's, there's some drugs called 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, um, drug called Proscar, Finasteride, um, and a related drug called Dutasteride. Uh, they probably if taken regularly, they do decrease the risk of getting prostate cancer by about 25%. They have some other potential side effects, but they do shrink the prostate a bit. Uh, they have some sexual side effects with which some men find um, 
uh, you know, disturbing and they like, uh, you know, erectile dysfunction, decreased semen and uh, things like that. And so, or then decreased sex drive. Um, but, but I think a heart healthy diet, exercise, don't smoke, uh, do what's good for your heart. And that's, uh, good, that's good for, to prevent prostate cancer as well. Yeah, I, I would agree with, uh, with that. And, and um, you know, there's really, there, there have been some studies done in the past, really large, large national studies looking at specific, you know, supplements, right? And vitamins like uh, selenium, vitamin E that looked at, you know, ability to decrease the incidence of prostate cancer. And they, so far, these specific kind of dietary supplemental interventions have failed. So I think you're kind of uh, really stuck with, with all these common sense measures that, uh, that Maren and Tim mentioned. Hey, you know, Shevik, do you, you want to mention, well, maybe we should talk to the, you want to talk about the button mushroom trial as, as a supplement? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about, yeah. So so that's actually a, a good good uh, point that, you know, we, we it, it's not that we are not thinking about perhaps studying nutritional supplements in various scenarios. Here, we actually have a clinical trial at St. John's, not necessarily for prostate cancer prevention, but in patients who have, kind of early prostate cancer that would be amenable to uh, active surveillance. So, uh, or patients who have very early relapsed prostate cancer, we are testing the uh, formulation of the tablet formulation that really contains white button mushroom powder uh, from based on some uh, laboratory studies that we have previously performed showing that it may have immune stimulatory effect that uh, can have some favorable anti-cancer effects. So, so yes, we are actually studying, uh, that's an example of kind of dietary supplement uh, intervention in early, early stages of prostate cancer. Thanks for, uh, for reminding me, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it's an important study. We wanna, get, we, wanna, we wanna understand how that can, uh, might help men. Right. Another question is, how do you manage complications of RARP, such as erectile dysfunction? What evidence is available to say the percentage of return of spontaneous erection? What was the last part of the question? What evidence is available to say the percentage of return of spontaneous erection? So, well, well the most important thing is prevention to begin with. So we think, um, um, well, number one, as I, as I, as I, I want to stress that men are still sexually active after prostatectomy, even if they can't get erections or can be. And although we, we commonly associate, we always, all men, uh, you know, associate erections with ejaculation and orgasm, the sensation of orgasm is a separate neurological event than, than the neurological, well, what neurologically causes the erection. So most of orgasm is in the brain and related to um, arousal and um, you know how erotic uh, the event is. And so men can still be sexually active. As I mentioned, they'll have the same sensation uh, to the penis, same sex drive, as long as their testosterone's normal and all the all other things. Um, but um, so we wanna, uh, during the surgery of RARP, we wanna um, protect the nerves. But no matter what we do to protect the nerves, we know that um, they don't like being moved off of the prostate. We try to spare them as much as we can and minimize damage to the nerves, but they, the inflammation from the surgery will cause some nerve dysfunction. So virtually all men have erectile dysfunction after prostatectomy, but if men have good erections before surgery and we can do a, an excellent nerve sparing surgery, the vast majority of those men will regain their erections, when I say, but it, it's dependent upon how good their erections were before surgery and also their age is a major factor. And, um, you know, it's also dependent on their uh, significant other or their partner and, uh, you know, a variety of things. Sex is more complicated than we generally think of. But so what we do after surgery is that we have men regularly take drugs like Viagra or Cialis, so what are called PDE5 inhibitors. These drugs won't work if the nerves are in shock after surgery, but we think they help nerve recovery. We can help, we can use devices like a vacuum erection device. We can use injection therapy to keep the penis healthy while the nerves are waking up. And Dr. Movasagi has what's called um, shockwave therapy in his office, which is kind of a newer therapy, which is being utilized to help erection recovery. So um, it's a process. 
but we think with appropriate surgical and best surgical techniques and with um, paying attention to it and getting on it early to help men keep the penis healthy, that erections have a high, uh, the highest possible likelihood of coming back. You want to add anything to that, uh, Miron? Yeah, no, I mean, I think all the things that you mentioned essentially are options, which, you know, we, we treat organic ED the same way, right? As guys get older, we know that erectile dysfunction is, a you know, essentially um, the biggest risk factor is age. Um, and radical prostatectomy, just like, you know, anything else is just one more risk factor. Um, in terms of things, other things that Tim didn't mention, we also have stem cell therapy that we can incorporate into right. such a penile rehab. Um, obviously, at the far end of the spectrum, if all else fails, there's prosthetics and, you know, a, 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 a penile pump, essentially, um, that can function, um, for better or worse, um, to allow men to have more of a, um, you know, a firmer penis, even though that, you know, the nerves don't work. Um, so it, it also is dependent on, you know, how... Uh, uh, motivated the patient is, you know, I have a lot of patients that I recommend, you know, surgery to, um, because everything else has failed and they're essentially like, you know, I'm going to find other, uh, other means to, you know, to satisfy myself. And the other thing to consider is, as men get older, um, you know, testosterone levels decline. And so, you know, it's important that when you're assessing erectile dysfunction, you know, you're not just looking at, you know, one aspect, which is the, okay, well, I had prostate surgery. That means I'm going to be impotent for the rest of my life. Well, a lot of guys don't have prostate surgery and they still have that problem. And sometimes it's hormonal. Um, and so it's important to know that, you know, there's options and there's treatments, um, but you have to look at it from a multi perspective, you know, multi angles, multi perspective. Um, and that's the, you know, and that's, a, that's when you're getting these informations and, and, you know, when I, you know, trying to do your homework in terms of, you know, who should I go to? You got to make sure that, you know, they're part of a, a essentially a, a multi-specialty team that is looking at it, not just from the oncological or the cancer approach, but also the quality of life aspects that come with it afterwards. You know, and I'll, I'll just add one, one small statement. You know, the earlier we diagnose prostate cancer and manage it appropriately, the better we're able to spare these kinds of functions, bladder function and, um, and, and sexual function, because the earlier we find it, the, the more we can spare and safely preserve neighboring tissue, whether it be with something like focal therapy, like high food, like Dr. Mofasagi does, or even active surveillance, we can avoid surgery altogether. Maybe the button mushrooms would be a, you know, a solution. So um, I think all the more reason to um, discuss screening PSA with, with the physician, you know, your primary care physician, maybe the urologist to see if you know, if you're at risk for having prostate cancer and if you need a biopsy to find it as early as possible when it exists, uh, but only doing biopsies as Dr. Mobasagi said earlier during his presentation, when the numbers indicate that you need to have it done. It's a very common sense approach these days. <laughs> we have another question. Um, it says, my uncle was diagnosed a year ago with prostate cancer. Does this increase my likelihood? Should I, a 30-year-old, do anything such as BRCA gene testing? Dr. Dr. Trudowski, you should you should take that one, I think. Yeah, so you know, you know, Uncle, uh, yeah, usually we, we think once you start going, you know, going beyond the first degree relative um, link, it, it it's much less significant. And you know, because prostate cancer is such a common disease, then your risk is probably you know marginally uh, if at all increased so we really we are talking about first degree relatives especially multiple family members so brother you know father now what, what is interesting though to remember that there are certain genes that uh, would be more likely to be uh, or, or certain diseases that would you know be uh, much more likely to occur in women the related uh, that 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 are related to the same genes, like breast cancer could be uh, uh, displayed in women carrying the same gene that can cause uh, prostate cancer in men. So, so that's important to take the family history also uh, on you know female side of the family. But usually uncle with uh, prostate cancer, um, especially you know if it's older age, that I would not think that's, that's something that would be particularly alarming beyond standard screening. But, but I think what, you know, perhaps it brings up, though, important 
uh, question of uh, or concept of much much better understanding that we have of genetics of prostate cancer still a long way to go uh, but you know we know now some very specific genes that are clearly linked to increased incidence uh, of disease that can be tested for but you have to be also judicious in you know screening for that great we do have another question as well at what stage of recurring prostate cancer could PSMA be most effective, cellular level or area of metastasis to the bone or other organs? Yeah, you know, so so right now the, the enthusiasm for again, I, I'm curious to hear what Dr. Wilson Movasagi think about it, but you know, enthusiasm is pretty broad, you know, for for PSMA in terms of. Uh, its applicability. So, you know, as a medical oncologist, uh, I tend to deal more with more advanced disease. And as I pointed out to you earlier on one of my slides, it can definitely detect uh, metastatic disease much more effectively than standard uh, uh, imaging like bone scan and even CT scan or perhaps even MRI. Uh, for 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 patients for patients with more localized early disease, it also can be very helpful. So it's really most likely will have a very broad applicability, and in fact that's reflected in FDA approval, which is very broad for this agent. So it's for essentially for staging, so for early kind of assessment of the extent of prostate cancer uh, in new diagnosis patients that we're concerned that may be considered for you know, surgery or, or local radiation. But it's also the, the other uh, indication is very broad and it states, you know, for patients who are suspected of having metastatic disease, which, which is a very broad um, statement. So I, I think it's it's really will, will revolutionize imaging, and a lot of us think that we really in the next year or two that will be the dominant image that we'll be uh, doing for prostate cancer over over certainly bone scan and uh, CAT scan. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I I don't have anything to add to that, Shemek. Mean, I think I think it's going to have broad applicability. Although we know it's not perfect, but it's certainly much better than CT scan and bone scan in finding yeah. areas of cancer outside the prostate. Also, it can help. It actually sees. Um, and it, I think there's some interest in maybe combining it with MRI in the future to see if it might even better localize kind of the worst spots in the in the prostate along with MRI. One question is, what is your stand about shockwave therapy for management of erection after RARP? So I'll take that one. Sure. Uh, there's, there's several small studies that show that in nerve sparing um, patients, it can help. Um, at, now, again, it, it depends on where the patient started. If their patient started with you know, erections five out of 10, uh, we're not gonna be able to do much better um, and you know, you do, usually what I tell patients is, you know, we have to have realistic goals. Um, but the idea of shockwave therapy is that it can help regenerate blood vessels, help essentially regenerate new tissue, um, and it's directly involved in as new blood vessels um, grow, then potentially small nerves can also regrow as well. Um, but if someone has had a non-nerve sparing, then it's it's less likely to be helpful. Um, as an, you know, a, a good number to kind of quote, even for patients who have their prostate intact and their nerves intact, I say there's about a 70% chance of efficacy. Um, I think that number drops a little bit after prostatectomy. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, um, it's just one of those things in the armamentarium we want to use to help men recover. And uh, we have to be realistic as Dr. Mobasagi said, um, it has very little downside, but it's not yet um, reimbursed by insurance. So it's some out-of-pocket cost for patients, which is, you know, some downside. So a few hundred bucks per session uh, is, I, it, it depends on what urologist is doing it. So, um, and how much they charge, but it's, uh, but we're interested in it here. And I think um, it's an important um, component of the armamentarium in helping men recover. One question is, can I go from hormone therapy to PSMA screening and radiation, then back to hormone therapy? 
Um, so I assume that will be for me from, can I go from hormone therapy to PSMA screening and then back to hormone therapy? It's, so I, I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. I mean, the, usually, so I, I would say this, that for patients who would require, for example, PSMA-based therapy that I mentioned, the lutetium PSMA therapy, that usually right now is going to be approved for somebody who have failed you know, multiple lines of treatment, including even chemotherapy, and they would have a maintenance of hormone therapy uh, through the through that process. So they would remain on hormone therapy. Uh, now, there is some question, I guess, whether if you're talking about perhaps different scenario of using the PSMA scan uh, for detection of you know, maybe early metastasis, whether the hormone therapy would interfere with that. Um, I don't think it's likely, although you know, there may be some theoretical concern that that's the case. But when you think about you know, a lot of the data that we have for PSMA imaging and how well it performs is actually in patients who are on ongoing hormone therapy. So, so I guess maybe I'm giving a little bit convoluted answer, but I would say that you, know, you don't have to stop hormone therapy to get a PSMA PET scan in order to, 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 to still have validity to the scan. And this will be our last question for the evening. What is the quality of life after treatment of prostate cancer comparing all treatments such as RARP, chemo, or radiation? I'll start. Um, I think if you do focal therapy, your quality of life is going to be probably at best, but you have to understand you're just treating the tumor that's there now. And the rest of the prostate, you're leaving intact. And that same prostate in the future, because it has the same genes and same environmental exposure and so on, may develop more cancer. So that in itself, for someone who's extremely nervous, may alter their quality of life. Um, whereas if you have your entire gland removed, while the chance of cancer recurrence is much lower, because if you don't have a prostate, it's unlikely that you're going to have recurrence. But in terms of the immediate aftermath, you're going to deal with temporary you know, incontinence and some uh, effect on your uh, erections. So you just kind of have to understand that. And also every type of treatment is really catered for different aggressiveness of the disease. So if we don't offer chemotherapy for someone who has low grade disease or that's in, that's in the prostate, that's confined to the prostate, um, we don't offer radiation to someone that has prostate cancer that's spread all over their body. So, you know, to answer that question, you kind of really have to look at, you know, every individual um, case and, and make recommendations based on that. Hey, right. yeah. I agree with Marin. I mean, if, if somebody who requires chemotherapy, usually it's a completely different situation than, um, you know, somebody that is being considered for curative um, local therapy like surgery and radiation. Usually chemotherapy is reserved for patients with metastatic disease that failed um, or, or perhaps certainly the, the, the metastatic disease. So the you know, quality of life on chemotherapy is diminished, no question about it. Fatigue, um, there are you know, taste changes, there are risks of infection and so on. It's, it can be managed and you know, it, it can be still very useful, but no question that chemotherapy would lower quality of life, you know, energy, uh, particularly. You know, I'll, I'll just I'll answer this from a little bit from a personal point of view, and also um, about maybe some public people that have that have had prostate you know, that have had prostate cancer treatment. Number one, my 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 grandfather, my father's father, died from metastatic prostate cancer, and I, I watched him go through it. It was an absolutely miserable death. Um, so his quality of life was horrible. Um, my brother-in-law had a radical prostatectomy. Now about 15 years ago, his quality of life is perfectly fine. He was de detected very early, had an excellent surgeon, a guy named Jeff Yoshida that uh, worked with me at the time, did his prostatectomy, recovered completely. Uh, my stepfather had, had a prostatectomy when his PSA was 11. He had Gleason score seven in five of six areas. 
had a radical prostatectomy, was cured just by surgery, went on to live another 20 years and died of heart disease. And I watched him and my mother travel the world. And I would say his life, his quality of life was excellent. Um, Arnold Palmer, the golfer, uh, had a radical prostatectomy for Gleason score seven when he was 67. And about a year and a half later, this was in the early 90s, his PSA was detectable. And then he had radio, he wasn't my patient, he made his information public. So, so I'm not violating HIPAA here, but he, he then went on to get radiation out at Eisenhower Hospital in Palm Springs, was cured, went on to live another 20 years. You watched him play golf. You watched him do commercials. His quality of life, I would say, was awesome. So most men that have prostate cancer treatment, uh, really, um, the vast majority have excellent quality of life. They might have, as we all do, with certain medical problems. We, you know, some, sometimes things are compromised, but most of us, most, most men with prostate cancer live normal lives and they go on to live, you know, uh, with excellent quality of life. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for taking the time to listen and ask questions this evening. And a big thank you to our team of experts for taking the time to provide us with this valuable information and for staying late, uh, even so, to answer even more questions. Uh, we'll be sending out a recording of the presentation to all attendees uh, for you to have. We also will be posting this on our Facebook page if anyone would like to rewatch re it later or share with friends. Uh, you can find us online at Providence St. John's Cancer Institute. And for any additional information or to schedule a physician appointment, please call 310-582-7137. Thank you again and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.